Okay guys, video two, all right? Um, how do we approach the scriptures? I don't know how to instruct you in how to approach the scriptures. You've got your own preconceived ideas and understandings and beliefs. From your culture has given you a level of understanding and um, any previous experience with the church, you, you've already got an understanding of the scriptures and Christianity, all right? So I'm gonna to talk to you as if you don't have that understanding. And I'm not gonna try and teach you how you should approach the scriptures. I'm gonna try and, if I can, sure, sounds grandiose, but I'm gonna give it a go at leading by example by approaching the scriptures. I run a clinic for addiction treatment. And we get people to us coming to us from all over the world. And at any one time, we could have four or five different nations all sitting in the same room and all kind of locked in to listen to me. I'm an evangelist, okay? So I challenge them and say, right, when we start to talk about spiritual assault, so say, right, let's pray together. Let me just try something. Let's pray together. And then they bow, they close their heads. Some of them do all kinds of aerobics and um, I'll lead in prayer. And I'll say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And nine times out of 10, 95% of the people sitting in front of me are praying along with me. They all know this prayer, okay? So I say to them, stop guys, what's this prayer called? What do we call this prayer? It's the Lord's Prayer. It isn't the Lord's Prayer. They've not learned that prayer by approaching the scriptures. They are regurgitating a prayer that they learned in their birdcage at school. Because if you say something to a bird often enough, it will repeat you, okay? So they are regurgitating a prayer that they've adopted and sometimes they look to it for solace and they've taken the words of Jesus out of their context and changed them to fit their own context when we should be taking our context and hoping it will change to fit the biblical context. So that's where we're going. Matthew chapter... Six is where we find that prayer. When Jesus said to the disciples, you pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, but you pray this way. And Jesus makes a distinction before that. Jesus says, and we're in Matthew chapter six, he says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phases like the Goyim, like the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not pray like them. So Jesus makes a distinction between his disciples and them. Who's the them? Who is, who's he referring to? So we go to the start of um, Matthew chapter 5 to find out. Jesus has been baptised. He's been into the wilderness. In Matthew chapter 4, he's been into the wilderness. He's established authority over Satan. He's come out of the wilderness. He starts calling men from the lower ranks of society. He starts turning unregenerate nobodies into born again nobodies, okay? And they start to follow him. And then we get to Matthew chapter five and Jesus is attracting quite a crowd, okay? They've seen what he's done. They've watched his ministry. They Every time he speaks, somebody changes. And then at the start of chapter five, Jesus, it says, Jesus seeing the crowds went up onto the mountain. And when his disciples sat down, his disciples came to them and he began to teach them, the disciples. There's the crowds, there's the disciples. Jesus walks up the mount, his disciples follow him, the crowds listen from a distance. That's the world at large. They want to know about Jesus, so they want to listen to things about Jesus, but the disciples want to get as close as they can because they want to become like Jesus. Jesus wants them to reflect his image when he leaves, okay? So chapter five, and then we go through the Sermon on the Mount, and then we go through, when we get into chapter six, he starts talking about fasting and praying, uh, fasting and giving and praying. And he makes this distinction. He said, when you fast, don't fast like they do. When you give, don't give like they do. When you pray, don't, lay, don't pray like they do. So they can't really call God Father. Jesus says to the disciples, when you pray, you call him Father. Okay, and this is the conception now. This is the embryonic state of what's going to become a 
a world-changing body of believers. Okay, if we go into the Gospel of John in chapter 20 from verse 19, we see on the day that Jesus left the tomb, empty, walked away from the grave, the resurrected Jesus comes out of the dead, rises from the dead, and he leaves that tomb empty, okay? And he's left the tomb. And that night, his disciples are recorded in John chapter 20 from verse 19. It says that they were in a room with the door locked in fear of the Jews. So this body of believers, he's called them away from their jobs and they've turned their backs on their careers to follow Jesus. Now at the feast of the Jews, they've turned their back on those traditions to huddle together like sheep without a shepherd. And then Jesus appears in their midst in John chapter 20. He spooks them. But he says, peace be with you, receive the Holy Spirit. They then receive the Holy Spirit. There's the church. Jesus, the risen Jesus, is the pastor. The risen Jesus is behind the pulpit. The risen Jesus is the word of God. And his disciples have encountered the risen Jesus. And they have everything about his ministry now makes sense because they are spirit sealed. But then they do not go out and witness into the, in their towns and villages until Acts chapter 2. 49 days later, when the Spirit is put outpoured from heaven, from heaven, and they are then empowered. So they've encountered the risen Jesus. They've received his peace. They've received his, the sealing of his Spirit. They've been prepared to walk away from their careers. They've been prepared to turn their back on their cultural heritage. There's the church. A little band of nobody misfits. That's who, that's who, those are our forefathers. Okay? On the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit is poured out from the day of Pentecost, this little posse goes out and slowly but surely overcome the Roman Empire and they become the largest religion, the largest faith on the planet okay this is how we approach the scriptures we keep them in context and we let them tell their own story with support from the old testament okay the old testament begins with five books genesis exodus leviticus numbers deuteronomy the new testament begins with five books matthew mark luke and john and the book of acts so Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is how the church was born. Acts is how the church is empowered and sent out. Okay. If you read Genesis 1, 2 and 3 and then read the Gospel of John 1, 2 and 3, you're going to see the same story. Creation, recreation. Okay. This is how we handle the scriptures. The Gospels are written so that men can be saved. Acts was written so that the, we can understand how the church was born, developed, and went out into the world. That's the model. There's no other model. There are no Baptists, Anglicans, Rastafarians. There's no mega church. There's no Rayma. There's no Toronto. Small bodies of men and women below radar in fear of the culture around them. That's where we're heading. We're heading back into that situation now. We're nearly there. We're nearly there. Churches are closing down. Thousands and thousands of Christians, now men and women who have been going to church for years, are suddenly start to have the, the scriptures taught to them by men from the lower ranks of society. It's got tattoos, you know. Oh, he's a heroin addict. Shame. <laughs> Here's a message for the middle to upper class churches until you start listening to men like me, not me, but men like me, whom God has drawn from the mud and empowered and educated and redefined and redesigned and re-educated. The church is going to keep on dying, but I'll tell you what, we need Christ. Our communities need a true, undiluted message of gospel from the scriptures. Okay? Right, what we're going to do is in the next video, we're going to look at how the Apostle Paul tells the church to study Judaism for their Christianity. Okay, we're not born again Christians, we're born again Judeo-Christians. 
True Christianity, the original Christianity, was built upon Judeo-Christian doctrine and teachings. That's where we're going next. God bless you, man. I love you.